Welcome to the Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing Series. I'm Tom Gilligan, Director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, the Hoover Institution and world-renowned library and archives have been collecting knowledge and generating ideas that support the pursuit of freedom and endeavor to improve the human condition. We've been able to occupy an eminent place in the think tank landscape by maintaining a focus on scholarly and empirical research that asks bold questions, offers powerful solutions for policymakers, and advances ideas to improve people's lives. These briefings are just one of the many ways we we're able to reach out and share some of the important work coming out of the institution. Thank you all for joining us today. As a reminder, we'll be taking audience questions throughout the briefing, and I wanna encourage you all to use the question tab at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Today's discussion is with economists Stephen Davis and Leo Hanian. Stephen is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the William H. Abbott Distinguished Service Professor of International Business and Economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, an economic advisor to the United States Congressional Budget Office, a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, an elected fellow of the Society of Labor Economics, and a senior academic fellow with the Asian Bureau of Finance and Economics. Lee is also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of economics and director of the Edinger Family Program in Macroeconomics Research at UCLA. He is an advisor to the Federal Reserve Banks of Minneapolis and St. Louis. He's previously advised other Federal Reserve Banks, foreign central banks, and the National Science Foundation. He also has testified to national state legislators, legislative committees on economic policy. He's a, he's a renowned expert on how economies recover from depressions. Stephen Lee, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Good to here, Tom. Good, appreciate seeing you both. Uh, you guys are both uh, university professors. Could you grade the policy, the economic policy responses to the current pandemic and tell us why you're giving the grade you gave? You wanna go ahead, Lee? Sure, sure. Um, so, Tom, I'm gonna have to grade on a curve here because it's, a, it's an unusual situation. Um, it's really unprecedented, and policymakers uh, were facing, you know, an awful trade-off. Um, do they shutter a lot of the economy, uh, or do they keep the economy going and risk a pandemic? Um, and at the same time, making decisions without full information uh, about the virus and about its effects. So it's a, it's a difficult situation. Um, what I would say, what it could, I think what it could have been much, much better is providing both businesses and households with information. So as we've been with COVID now for two plus months, three months, we've learned a lot about the virus. And one thing we've learned is that the risk factors are remarkably different across individuals. Older people with hypertension, diabetes, cardiopulmonary disease are at relatively high risk. Younger middle-aged people without those medical issues um, are at very low risk as far as we know. Um, and that's information I think that most people, it, it, perhaps they may know it now, but they did not know it before. And that kind of information is necessary so people can make the best informed decisions. Um, I think a lot of people have been flying really by radar, uh, not knowing it as much as they could have. So I think that's an area where a lot of improvement could have been made. Got it. Steve? Yeah, so I think uh, C is, I agree, C is about the right grade. Um, in addition to what Lee said, uh, I, you know, what bothers me about the initial wave of policy responses is it was premised uh, on the idea that the economy was going to go into a deep freeze for a few weeks, it would be a big thaw, and we'd all go back to the same jobs and the same businesses, the same locations as we had before the pandemic hit. And I think it was evident early on that that premise is in considerable part wrong. Now, many people will go back to their old jobs, um, but many won't. And the reason I think it was evident pretty early on is because the, the pandemic and the reaction to it uh, generated some large shifts in the structure of the economy and, and the structure of labor demand that we could see early on weren't going to be fully reversed. I'll mention three big areas. The first is consumer spending patterns. There is of necessity been millions of American households that have experimented or increased their use of uh, online 
shopping and delivery, okay? As mm -hmm. opposed to going to the grocery store or some other retail, some other bricks and mortar uh, retail outlet. Um, well, as some of those people learn how to do this, they find they like the convenience, they're going to continue doing that before. I think that was an entirely anticipated consequence of the crisis and really accelerating trends that had already been present in the economy before. But that means fewer jobs in traditional brick and mortar retail outlets uh, and more jobs in warehouse distribution delivery services, Amazon, Walmart, and so on. So that's the first thing. Second thing is business travel. Okay, we're doing this via Zoom. Businesses all over the world are figuring out that a lot of the travel they used to do is dispensable. That you can substitute at least imperfectly for face-to-face -face meetings with uh, audio-visual technologies that are much less expensive, much less time consuming. That means big reduction in demand for airline travel, especially the high-end business class seats that are a big source of airline revenue, a big decline in demand for high-end hotel lodging, again, often dominated by businesses, and a reduction in, say, high-end restaurant, the kinds of places business people tend to go to uh, when they're traveling in particular. That's the second big shift. And the, the third big shift is, the work, is work from home, okay? You know, again, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, we're trying to figure out how to work from home. It doesn't always work well, but sometimes it does. And uh, I think much of the shift to work from home that has been driven by the pandemic mm -hmm. will stay in place after the pandemic is over. Yeah. And that means office workers, for example, will be spending their dollars in different places. Mm -hmm. They won't be spending them as much in downtown restaurants uh, during lunch and after work. They'll be spending it more near the place where they work. All yeah. of that means shifts in the structure of the economy, shifts in where jobs happen and which jobs happen. And so we want, we want to let that process play out expeditiously rather than trying to freeze everything in place. Yeah. That's my Lee, do you, do you agree with Steve in this? It, well, do you see any other ways in which the economy might permanently change as a result of COVID-19? Steve made a number of really good points. And the hallmark of any successful economy, you know, and what what I mean by that is one that easily finds matches for most of its workers. So employment's high, has continuous growth at a reasonable rate, high standard of living. Those types of successful successful economies are ones in which there's change. There's always change. Um, uh, think back a hundred years ago, 120 years ago, half half of Americans worked on the farm. Today, three-tenths of 1% of Americans work on the farm. So we see these trends, and Steve made some really good points about how retail is never going to be the same. And retail was struggling before this with Amazon. Um, so one silver lining to the dark cloud is that as retail space becomes available because it's no longer socially productive, as other uses, that can possibly be converted into residential use, uh, potentially mixed use development, which includes residential, as well as restaurants, cafes. Um, we have a critical housing shortage uh, in some states more than others. I mean, here in California, um, looking at the average priced home in the San Francisco Bay Area, if someone wanted to qualify for an 80% mortgage on that home, they need a combined household income of about $350,000. And that's just another way of saying there's a, there's a housing supply shortage. We're not building enough housing. As retail space empties out, that's a great way to, pr pr to produce more residential housing. So I think we're going to see COVID accelerating a lot of trends, such as decline in retail, uh, that were in place before. I think ultimately trends that were going the other way, such as people going out to restaurants and bars and clubs, those were those had been rising before COVID. And I suspect that once we have effective treatments and safe and effective vaccines that are widely available, 
those areas of the economy that have, that have been hurt so much with COVID uh, will ultimately come back. Uh, the big question mark is when will people feel safe enough to go into a you know, to go into a restaurant that's potentially crowded. So I think we'll see those coming back, but it's uncertain when that will occur. It really depends on the science of the development of treatment and vaccines. Yeah. Steve, could you give us some sense of the magnitude of the structural shifts that you're talking about? Is there any evidence, for example, that tells us uh, how much more work will be done from home in the future? Sure. I'll, get, I'll, I'll talk about the work from home and maybe give one or two other statistics. So yeah. now my colleagues and I working with the Atlanta Fed field a uh, monthly survey of a panel of business executives. And this month we asked them questions about work from home. And the point of the questions was to try to get at the <clears throat> size of the shift <clears throat> in work from home before the pandemic hit mm -hmm. to the situation after the pandemic is resolved. And the bottom line of what we found is there'll be a tripling of the amount of time spent working at home as opposed to on the business premises. And in terms of office workers, this basically means that about a fifth of activity that used to take place in offices uh, by the workers will now take place at home. Mm -hmm. That's a big shift. And what it means is those office workers will be spending less uh, on meals at lunchtime, uh, activities, maybe going to the bar downtown uh, after work. Uh, than they were before. So they're still going to have money to spend. It's just that they're going to spend it in different locations. Yeah. And it, that's why we need, going back to what Lee was saying, that's why we need, in order to be successful as an economy and a society, we need the capacity to make these kinds of adjustments in jobs quickly to accommodate where people want to spend their money. Yeah, got it. Now, I'll give you one other statistic since you asked me about the magnitude of these shifts. So my colleagues and I estimated that about 42% of the jobs that have been lost as a result of the pandemic are not coming back. Okay? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean those people won't have jobs, but they'll have different jobs than they had before. Sure. And again, that's, that's, that's millions of people. That's maybe 10, more than 10 million people who need to find a different job. Mm. So instead of trying to freeze the economy in place, we need to put more attention on trying to provide new opportunities for these folks who lost jobs that aren't coming back. If we can do that quickly or we'll recover from the pandemic quickly on the economic front, if we can't do it quickly, we're gonna be mired in a downturn for a long time. Got it. If you're just joining us, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is the Hoover Institution's virtual policy briefing with Stephen Davis and Leo Hanian. Uh, Lee, Stephen, and you both talked about the policies creating a, a stasis or, or freezing things in place when we need to be more dynamic and adjusting right now. Can you talk about some of the disincentives that have been created in, in the government policies that have been passed, like the CARES Act, et cetera, and give us a sense of what you think we need to do to fix those rigidities that were built in by the policies. Sure, sure. Um, you know, what we need to do right now is we need to restore work and do that safely. Um, so policy should have those goals front and center. And people, you know, I mean, I, mean, I there are weeks when I get 10 or 15 calls or emails from journalists asking me about what will the, what will the recovery look like? Will it be a fast recovery, slow recovery? And I say, you know, it's going to be a qualified answer. It really depends upon economic policy. The policies that are implemented are so important for how fast an economy recovers. In principle, we can recover quite quickly if policy does incentivize low risk workers to returning to work and how might we go about doing that? Well, right now in the CARES Act, there was uh, unemployment uh, insurance, unemployment benefits uh, were increased and we can all certainly understand why that was the case. This new virus hit, we didn't know very much about it. As far as I knew from the experience in China, the fatality rate was quite high, maybe as much as 2%. So policymakers' reaction was, we've got to shut down the economy except for essential services. 
we've learned a lot more about the virus and its effects, and in particular, serious effects um, are relatively rare for young, healthy people, uh, middle-aged people. Uh, not so much for older people with comorbidities, um, but we know who is relatively low risk and who's relatively high risk. We want to get the lowest people back to work. Um, how do we do that? We need to reform the unemployment uh, benefits um, to make them, I would say, unconditional. So as a society, we can certainly support lower earning households, um, but we don't want to tie it to them remaining at home. We want to get the low risk people back to work and we can continue the support that we're giving them. Um, so that would be a policy like a wage subsidy if your, if your market wage was below a certain level. Or something. That's exactly right. Yeah, it goes back to the old idea about Milton Friedman and the negative income tax, which is a way of subsidizing work and getting um, uh, workers without a lot of experience, younger workers, to get them a higher wage, uh, after-tax wage. And we need to make sure those people feel protected and they feel safe going back to work. So we can incentivize businesses to protect their workers. Uh, right now, businesses have an experience rating as far as unemployment goes. Mm -hmm. if, a lot of your, if a lot of your workers become unemployed, you pay higher insurance premiums because you're a high risk business. Well, we can give businesses tax credits if they do a good job taking care of their employees and very few of their employees, hopefully none, come down with COVID. Um, so right now we need to get the right incentives in place for low risk people to get back to work and they need to feel safe and protected when they do go back to work. And if we can do that and let the market take care of itself, uh, we can have uh, a very strong recovery. As Steve mentioned, it might take some time because some jobs won't exist anymore and people have to find new matches. And that doesn't happen overnight. But um, if I could just say one more thing, the recoveries from World War II and the Great Depression um, really paint very different pictures of, of what good policy looks like. Those were two enormous emergencies. We had an incredibly rapid recovery after World War II, uh, despite the fact that Paul Samuelson went to Congress and testified that we're going to have massive unemployment, the Great Depression will return. Um, we had no Great Depression after World War II. The economy really re restored very, very quickly, and it restored very, very quickly in Europe because yeah. the market economy and the market forces are so powerful. People want to consume and save for retirement and give a good life for their families. That is front and center. So that can take place. Now go back to the Great Depression. Jobs didn't come back until about 1940. Well, why is that? The research I've done with Hal Colt, the University of Pennsylvania suggests is because well-intentioned policies that distorted the normal forces of supply and demand left a lot of workers out of jobs um, because those policies enormously magnified monopoly power. And today we know that increasing monopoly power is not the way to prosperity. So yeah. policy really is front and center in, in determining how we recover from this, from this uh, emergency. Got it. Stephen, the uh one of your answers has gotten the attention of a lot of our viewers and they asked the following questions. Uh, both Peter and DH asked the question on the prediction of 42% of jobs not coming back, what types of jobs are those and what types of jobs will make up the future career opportunities for those unemployed? Okay, um, among the jobs that have been lost during the pandemic, um, they've been dominated by the low end, the low end of the wage distribution. And if you think about it for a minute, that makes good sense because a lot of the, a lot of the jobs that involve personal face-to-face -face interactions are in sectors like brick and mortar retail, in restaurants and bars, coffee shops, personal services. And those activities are uh, predominantly uh, occupied uh, by people with less education who make less income. So I think when we, when we think about bringing the economy back online and doing so in a manner that's flexibly responds to the kinds of shifts that I talk, talked about earlier, it's really important to remember we're, we're really talking about the livelihood of people who were already kind of you know, eking by or else they were younger people just starting out in their career to start with. So what are some, what, you know, what are some of those jobs? What do we need? Two things. I already indicated earlier in my response to your work from home question that some of it is just a shift in where the jobs will happen. So there's gonna be more office workers working at home. That means 
they're going to be spending more dollars in for lunchtime near their home rather than in the office. So there's simple things like that. Um, but then there are folks who used to work in a brick and mortar retail and maybe they can't work in brick and mortar retail anymore because demand is down there. Mm. But there are big increases already uh, in warehouse and delivery oriented firms and in takeout and delivery oriented restaurant. Amazon itself is according to news reports hired a more than 200,000 additional employees uh, in the last, you know, in the last couple, two, three months since mm -hmm. the pandemic hit. Walmart, right. another company that's hired you know, more than 100,000 plus extra employees. Same for CBS Caremark. And then we have uh, takeout oriented delivery firms like uh, Domino's Pizza, Papa John's. Mm -hmm. um, another area, there is a, there's a big need for contact tracing, okay? Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, think about where we could spend government dollars productively. We need to set up contact tracing uh, in states and localities throughout the country. Of course, that's happening to some extent. Uh, it would be great if it could happen more rapidly. It is an example of how even after the pandemic has passed, we probably want to maintain uh, a greater capacity for contact tracing in the future to deal with future outbreaks of some mutated version of COVID-19, mm -hmm. the seasonal flu that we face every year. So that's an ex there's an area where those jobs are kind of low to medium skill. Uh, yeah. You can be trained for those jobs in a few days or a few weeks at most. So there are many opportunities, but you know, to go back to, uh, here, I'm echoing something Lee said and things I said earlier. Um, it's really critical that we allow the economy to have the capacity to respond to these things quickly. And we have some policies on the books, even from before the pandemic, that slow that process down. And I, I can talk about that later if you'd like. No, uh, go ahead and start, Steve. This, you know, the basic question is, what, pol what policy options do we have now to make the economy more dynamic in the future? What, what, what would you recommend? Let me, let me mention two things. And these were already on the books long before the pandemic hit, but they, bite with particular force now because we have this need to reallocate the economy. First one is occupational licensing restrictions. So there's more than a thousand different job occupations that are licensed by state level governments, uh, mostly state level governments throughout the country. And what a license says is you can't work in this job unless you have a license from a government authorized body that says you're entitled to work in this job. To get a license, you typically have to pass tests, pay fees, and serve apprenticeships. And there's very little relationship between the difficulty of the job and how onerous it is to meet these licensing requirements. They apply to everything from florists, tree trimmers, dog groomers, hairdressers, you know, people who do your nails in a, hair, in a salon and so on. So there's just hundreds of these. That's the first point. So they make it harder for people to move into these activities if they lost their job in some other activity. Second thing, and this came, to, this came out in, during the pandemic, these licensing restrictions are typically not reciprocal across state boundaries. Mm -hmm. So for example, New York, which was hit tremendously hard by the COVID-19 virus, found itself wanting to bring healthcare personnel from other states into New York to help it out. And they ran into licensing restrictions. You're a doctor in another state, but you can't practice in New York because you got your license in another state, not in New York. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, Governor Cuomo looked at that and said, this is insane. Okay, and so those licensing restrictions for healthcare personnel were relaxed. My view is they were also a milder version of insane before the pandemic hit. Right. That is an example of how we slow down the ability of the economy to respond to shocks. Right. And we mentioned earlier, a successful economy is one that can respond to shocks effectively. Yeah. I'll give you one, I'll give you a second example, Tom. Sure. Also in the healthcare center, also it's highly salient in the wake of the pandemic, certificate of need laws. So most of the states, not all of them, about 35 states have certificate of need laws on the books. Uh, in the healthcare sector. And what it means is if you want to open a new hospital, add beds to an existing hospital, 
open a new medical clinic, expand the kinds of procedures and equipment you use in an existing medical clinic, provide a new ambulance service. You've got to demonstrate need in mm -hmm. front of a board. And the mm -hmm. board is not looking at whether you're competent. They're not looking at what your track record is in providing this kind of medical care. They're mm -hmm. looking at whether there's a need, so to speak, in the local community. Yes. Well, who gets to come and testify before the board? Your prospective competitors. What do the prospective competitors often say? They say, well, we don't need this. We're already providing this service. Mm -hmm. What happens, and this is well documented in, in a body of empirical research that's grown up over the last decade or two, is in states that have certificate of need laws on the books, you got fewer hospital beds per capita. You have less in the way of emergency services, ambulances, and so on. Um, patients have to go farther to get to hospitals, okay? Obviously, this came to bite, this came, you know, bit us in a big way during the pandemic when uh, several states and cities found that they had a shortage of healthcare capacity. And I'm not saying that the certificate of need laws are the main reason for that shortage, but they illustrate how regulations can inhibit the ability of the economy to prepare for contingencies like pandemics and how they also will slow down the ability of the economy to respond to the new structure that's likely to emerge. I think we've learned from this pandemic that we need to make additional investments in healthcare capacity. Certificate of need laws is like uh, sand in the gears that slow that process down and sometimes stop it entirely. Yeah, exactly. You're um, listening. Can I, can I follow up just on a couple of points that that's you know, hey, Lee, I'd like to get. We have some really good okay. questions. Okay. Okay. And I want to get to and, and once once for you. I just I want to remind everybody we're listening to Hoover Senior Fellows Stephen Davis and Leo Haney, and you can find more research by Hoover Fellows at Hoover.org. Uh, Lee, this one's you, and it's from Paul. He said you, you compared the widely differing outcomes from the Great Depression and the end of World War II. Can you explain why there was such widely different outcomes? Also. Why did the 1918 flu have such a minimal effect on the economy? when well, we know it killed a lot of people. Right, okay. Uh, okay, Paul, very good question. This, so, by the way, can't be your lecture. I mean, this, we've got a short amount of time. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, so um, after World War II, there is uh, economic policy was entirely focused on getting markets back to work and the country was poor because the 1930s was a decade of very, very low investment. Uh, the 1940s was a decade of low investment because of the war. So all economies were poor and there was really a general recognition that economic growth and rebuilding capacity was central. And this was the mindset of policy and policies were implemented that had those goals front and center. In the Great Depression, very different policies. There was a mistaken view that cartelization, that expanding monopoly power was the road to prosperity. And as we know today from both economic logic as well as you know, hundreds of studies, monopoly depresses employment, monopoly depresses output. Uh, in terms of your question about the pandemic and economic activity back in 1918, uh, I'm going to have to pass on that. I just don't. Uh, economic statistics are pretty shady from that period. We don't have really precise data, uh, so I don't have I, do, I don't have a particularly good answer for that. So I'll have to pass on that one. You got it, Stephen. Did you want to say add to that answer at all? Well, I'll, I'll offer a few things about the you know why the economy didn't respond as negatively uh, to the Spanish flu as it has to this uh, current pandemic. And these, these are a bit speculative because I don't think we fully know the answer, but there, there are a few things to point to. Um, the economy was much more agrarian and manufacturing based then than it is now. So obviously it's kind of easy to socially distance in an agrarian society relative to a highly urbanized one. So we're, we're much more urbanized than we are were then and the kinds of economic activities that we carry out now um, are much more likely to involve kind of close physical proximity. Uh, so that's probably part of the reason. Um, second, I think, you know, and here I'm borrowing from something I heard, I've, I've heard from Neil Ferguson, you know, well-known historian and senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. And uh, Neil makes the point that there were a number of risks that we faced in our everyday life um, 100 years ago that we don't face now. 
uh, we were, we didn't have as, you know, in terms of antibiotics, in terms of antivirals, uh, we didn't have vaccines then for things like polio. Um, and so people were more accustomed to, you know, bad stuff can happen and you might just die or something severely happened to you, um, you know, within the next few months. And they went about their lives anyway. Uh, I think we've grown more cautious and risk averse. In part, that makes sense because we're richer. And one of the things you buy when you're richer is safety. And so we can afford now as a society in a way we could not have 100 years ago to shut down 40% of the economy for several weeks. Um, and I think we've decided individually uh, and socially to make a different trade-off than we did 100 years ago, um, partly for good reasons, but, but maybe not entirely for good reasons. You know, we, we may also have overreacted uh, in the nature of the response uh, that we uh, had this pandemic. So that's a partial answer. I don't think it's a full answer to the, the question. It's a great question. Yeah. Lee, could you speak to the uh, impacts of the debt that we're now accumulating to try to dig out of this economic hole? Is there any long run repercussions for economic growth? Sure. So this is an emergency. During emergencies, we issue a lot of debt. Uh, unfortunately, our debt to GDP ratio before the pandemic was about 75%. That had doubled, um, that ratio had doubled during the period of the financial crisis. So unfortunately, we're gonna be hitting almost certainly 100% debt to GDP, we may go above that. We have not been in that territory since World War II, which at that time, debt to GDP was 125%. Now, what happened at that time? Uh, we worked our way out of that. Um, we gradually reduced the debt to GDP ratio because policymakers, the presidents at that time and the Congresses at that time realized that we had a debt problem and revenues and public expenditures needed to confront that. And they did. Today, we have a slightly different, you know, frame of mind among policymakers. Um, you know, I would say, when was the last time you heard your famous, you know, your favorite politician talk about the need to reduce spending, uh, to get to bring spending in line with future tax revenues? It's a political non-starter. It's politically costly for politicians to talk about the upcoming challenges we face, but we do face upcoming challenges. Uh, revenues are gonna be well below public expenditures if we don't make changes at both the federal level and the state and local level. So economic growth, um, the American economy has always rebounded. It's always grown um, and it can this time too, but sooner is better than later that policymakers confront what is coming up with social security spending, Medicare spending, Medicaid spending. All of these need to be really soberly addressed uh, and in a nonpartisan way. And just to take a 15 second, um, make a 15 second statement about one of the issues Steve pointed out, occupational licensing. A lot of people I meet who are not economists often think there's enormous partisan divides among economists. Um, uh, that's, they would be really shocked to know there's relatively little partisan divide. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the Obama administration, there was enormous concerns about occupational licensing. Occupational licensing proponents say this is all for consumer safety. And as Steve pointed out, well, there's a lot of that for protection of incumbents. So just as much as Republican Congress's administrations worry about occupational licensing, it was front and center with the Obama administration as well as how it was depressing opportunity yeah. and depressing economic activity. Got it. Uh, Stephen, uh, John asked the following question, which is basically, a uh, question about the disconnect between the real economy and financial and stock markets. The real economy seems to be suffering and stock markets have recovered to a very large extent from their fall in early February, March. Can you help reconcile those two economic uh, differences? Yeah, um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, let me say three things that I think go a long way to reconcile this apparent disconnect between the stock market and the real economy. First thing to understand is most people, even most private sector workers, don't work for a publicly listed company that trades on a stock exchange. 
It's a very basic point, but the stock market does not reflect the whole economy. It reflects expected future profits mm -hmm. for a sector for a minority of the economy. So that's kind of point one. Second point to understand is that the disproportionate share of the people who've lost their jobs uh, in the wake of the pandemic are at the low end of the wage distribution. They, are, they earn lower wages and they're less productive than say more educated, more skilled people who get paid more. What that means is that even though we've had a huge number, just a spectacular increase in the number of people who are unemployed, we've had a smaller increase in kind of the loss of labor power in the economy because most of the highly productive people are still working, okay? So that's a second thing to understand about why it looks like there's a disconnect, say, between the stock market and the unemployment numbers or the job loss numbers. Third thing, and I think the, um, the question actually alluded to this a bit, initially from kind of late February in the first few weeks of March, the stock market really tanked. It fell by about 30% at its peak. And that was before most of the pandem pandemic deaths happened and before most of the job losses. But it reflects the fact that financial markets tend to be forward looking. They don't always get it right, but they look forward. And they saw even before the worst aspects of the pandemic manifested itself, this is gonna be really bad the stock market tank. Then as it looked like we were starting to bottom out, we were getting better treatments for, the, uh, for people who were suffering serious uh, symptoms from the virus. Uh, we were starting to figure out how we might partially reopen the economy, uh, even, as the, even, uh, even as the virus continues uh, to spread at a lower rate. The stock market looks forward to that too and says, well, that's grounds for optimism. And so the stock market hasn't fully recovered, but it's come back a long ways. Implicit in that recovery is the view, which might turn out to be wrong, but the view implicit in that recovery is we're going to, over the next few quarters, kind of recover, uh, recover to where we were or something close to where we were before the pandemic. So I think those three things taken together help you to reconcile the, what looks like on the face of it, a big disconnect between the stock market Wall Street and Main Street. Got it. We're almost out of time, guys, but Michael asked a really good question that I want to end on. I want both your opinions on it. He says, there will be more pandemics in the future. How should we modify our responses for the next one? Should it be the same or worse? Is there a way to not shut down everything? Yeah, yeah. So um, great question. Uh, in this case with the virus, I think it really was an issue of learning. So early on the pandemic, people were remarkably scared because it seemed like the fatality rate was very high. And there wasn't really a recognition of how differently the virus hits people of different ages and with comorbidities. So I think one issue is that we need to make upfront investments um, you know, before the next pandemic comes along. For an example, uh, in my state of California, around 2000, uh, 2007, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor. There had been an outbreak of flu around that time. I think it was H1N1, so it was fairly serious. Schwarzenegger was worried about the next pandemic, so he invested millions in mobile hospital capacity, including, issue, including, including equipment such as ventilators that we need so much today. And he made enormous investments so that that equipment would be there. Uh, in about 10, 2010 or 11, um, Jerry Brown was governor. We had the budget crisis reflecting the financial crisis. And the decision was made not to maintain that stock of protective equipment. Well, that stock of protective, of, uh, protective equipment went away. And guess what happened? We get, to, we get with COVID and suddenly we need ventilators and masks and portable hospital space all of which we had made, ironically, a previous investment in. Um, so that's what, both at the federal level and the state level, we can prepare much, much better um, should, should another pandemic come along. So it really is an issue of governance and how governments prioritize what they should be doing. Protecting people is, I think, job, job one for governments. And if, if, uh, if they're able to do that, we'll be in a much better position should another pandemic come along. Uh, Stephen? 
two big things that I think are really important. One, if you look around the world, the countries that have fared relatively well in containing the virus have much, much better systems for testing, contact tracing, isolating people who get sick. So what that means is there's less transmission from, person, from infected people to others, and you don't overwhelm the, health, you know, the capacity of the healthcare system. The US is way behind the curve on that. That is a type of public good that the government at the state, local, and national levels needs to invest in. So, so we should have a contact tracing facility in place before the pandemic hits. Mm -hmm. We should be prepared to ramp up testing much more quickly than we did at this time. And that means allowing testing to happen, not just at Center for Disease Control facilities, but as we eventually did in private uh, and, um, yeah. and university healthcare facilities as well. So I think we, we fell short on that. We can do better, we can look, we can look uh, at how it was done in others. And second thing is, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Second thing is accelerated vaccine development. Now, we, we've sort of done that, but it had, there was a lot of resistance to getting there. The FDA uh, it, you know, has protocols in place that might make sense in normal times, you know, where it takes a long time to develop, test before you roll out vaccines. This is not a normal circumstance. Mm -hmm. We should have on the shelf emergency protocols that you can roll out immediately anytime there's a new potential pandemic threat that strikes the society so we can immediately ramp up our vaccine capacity. One last observation on this point. You know, there was a, and again, I also learned this from Neil Ferguson. There was a pandemic in the United States in 57, 58, if I remember correctly. And um, it looks like it was about as bad as in terms of uh, fatalities as COVID-19 is likely to be. Uh, it was influenza. It wasn't kind of the SARS family of viruses. We developed a virus and deployed it at scale within a few months. Mm. Okay? That just seems hard to imagine in the current environment. And I think partly because we've, we've grown this regulatory apparatus that might have some pluses, but it's not flexible enough to respond quickly and adeptly to emergency situations. So we need to prepare for the next pandemic, which we're likely to face another one. Uh, this, won't, this won't be the last one. Got it. Stephen Lee, wonderful discussion. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. Our next uh, Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing will be Tuesday, June 2nd at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern with Jacqueline Snyder and Herb Lynn. They'll be talking about cybersecurity. That Jacqueline Snyder is a fellow at the Hoover Institution focusing on the intersection of technology, national security, and political psychology. Before beginning her academic career, she spent six years as an Air Force officer in South Korea and Japan and is currently a reservist assigned to U.S. Cyber Command. In 2018, she was included in CyberScoop's lead list of influential cyber experts. Herb Lin is the Hank J. Holland Fellow in Cyber Policy at the Hoover Institution. He is a, he's a Chief Scientist Emeritus for the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board and National Research Council of the National Academies. He also served as a professional staff member and staff scientist for the House Armed Services Committee. You can join Tuesday's briefing at the same link you signed in on today. And you will find the Hoover Institution online at hoover.org and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Again, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please have a wonderful week.